All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for attending today's presentation on evictions. Just a couple reminders um, for the presentation today. Um, if you could keep your cameras and audio off during the presentation, that reduces distractions um, throughout the presentation. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box and I will relay them to our presenter um, at the end of her presentation. Also, if you need a certificate of participation or completion for today's training, um, please, they are only given to those who sign in on day of presentation. Please type your first and last name along with your email in the chat at the end of the presentation, and we will be sure to get those out to you. But again, um, certificates are only given to those who sign in on the day of the presentation. Um, first, last name and email in the chat at the end of the presentation. So with that, I will introduce Christino Christina from um, the Makoff Kellogg Law Firm in Dickinson, and she will be presenting on evictions. Thank you, uh, Kylie. Good morning, everyone. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, want to say thank you for being and uh, offer the opportunity to speak again this year. This, I think, will be the third year in a row that I have done this, and, and so I do uh, enjoy the opportunity to, to give some uh, very simple, very basic uh, legal advice to landlords across the state who are, deal with these issues on a daily basis. Uh, so just wanna begin, uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm practicing at the Makoff Kellogg Law Firm in Dickinson. I have been for about 10 years now. I handle a majority of the evictions, um, I represent a lot of clients in Dickinson, a lot of clients um, uh, in, uh, a Watford City um, and even some up in the Williston area and uh, various um, private uh, entities that uh, uh, act as landlords within the within the southwest area. So a little bit of everything with regard to the practice. Uh, we've we've kind of seen it all when it comes to evictions. So uh, feel free to um, let me know if you have any questions at the very end of the presentation. But uh, just to get a very basic understanding of what an eviction is, uh, we'll start with that. Um, and so again, um, just let me know if you have any questions at the very end. The North Dakota Century Code does give a very specific definition of what an eviction is and when an eviction can be maintained. And what it essentially is, it's the legal process to recover possession of real estate. And it can happen in various uh, forms under various circumstances. And I've listed them by statute here on the first slide. Uh, first, uh, a party by force, intimidation, fraud, or stealth has entered upon the prior actual possession of real property of another and detains the same. Uh, that very rarely, rarely ever happens. 
option number two, a party after peaceably entering upon real property turns out by force, threats, or menacing conduct, the party in possession. That also very rarely happens. Uh, number three, a party by force or by menace and threats of violence unlawfully holds and keeps the possession of any real property where, whether the possession was acquired peaceably or otherwise. Again, very, very unusual. Number four, a lessee in person or by subtenant holds over after the termination of a lease or expiration of the lessee's term or fails to pay rent for three days following the after the rent is due. That's the, that's the major um, point uh, with the evictions. Uh, that's where we're going to have a situation where uh, the, the lease is terminated by its terms, uh, the individual is still re residing in the unit, or we've got a situation where a tenant is not paying rent. Uh, that's Christina, going to be the major one. Yep. Your, your slides are not advancing. Um, it should only be on the second one. It, we just have evictions 101 with your, um, with your name on the front. It is showing up on mine. Um, let me try this. Um, is that still showing? Just the evictions 101 is showing right now. Huh. Well, it is moving on my slide. Interesting. Let me try something else here. If you can hear me, mine says uh, that there's a line through start video. Interesting. Um, let me just see. It's okay. Is that sharing? Yep. Now your evictions 101 came up. Now is that going to the second one? Yes. Yes. No. Okay. So we're on this. We're we're good now. Yep. We're good. Okay. Perfect. Thank All right. You. you thank you for letting me know. All right. Moving on then. Uh, so evictions can also occur uh, on number five here. A party continues in possession after a sale of real property under mortgage execution order or by other judicial process, and after the expiration of the time fixed by law or redemption or at the execution of delivery of a deed or after the cancellation and termination of any contract for deed, bond for deed, or other instrument for future conveyance of real estate or equity in the real estate. This is the most common in a situation where we've got a mortgage foreclosure. Um, mortgage companies uh, deal with this uh, all the time. Our, our law firm used to represent uh, the major mortgage, mortgage uh, banks uh, in the state of North Dakota. And so we, we dealt with this a lot, but this one is specific to uh, instances where mortgages are being uh, defaulted on and uh, uh, homeowners are not vacating the premises after the foreclosure is concluded. Number six, the party continually continues wrongfully in possession after a judgment in partition or after a sale under an order or decree of district court. Very rarely does this happen uh, as well. Uh, this would be a situation where if the court were to order a partition where one party got a particular parcel of property and that party doesn't vacate uh, the pro property that they did not receive within that district court action. And number seven, a lessee or person on the premises with a lessee's consent acts in a manner that unreasonably disturbs other tenants' peaceful enjoyment of the premises. Uh, this is another biggie when it comes to evictions. Uh, this is where we've got uh, situations where we've got noise complaints, um, things of that nature. Number eight, the lessee violates material term of a written lease agreement between the lessor and the lessee. So let's dive into each one of these a little bit more thoroughly. Uh, let's specifically talk about the failure to pay rent because that again is the big one. This is the most common reason that we see eviction actions needed. Uh, and a lessee, as I indicated before, holds over after the termination of a lease or expiration of the lessee's term or fails to pay rent for three days after the rent is due. So 
what you need to do and what you should be looking at as landlords is checking the, the lease for penalties with regard to failure to pay rent timely. Uh, does your lease provide for late fees? Are you able to collect them? And check the lease terms uh, because again, sometimes your leases have different requirements. Uh, sometimes they have different statutory periods or uh, timeframes in which notice must be given. So just don't assume that it's a three-day notice. Uh, and the three-day notice, uh, we, you know, sometimes we call it a notice to quit. Uh, sometimes it's a notice of termination. There are various uh, forms of which it's called, but essentially you can serve that once three days expires after the, the failure to pay rent. The next one, uh, the bigger one, a uh, more common one, again, is disturbing the peace. Uh, this is where a lessee or person on the premises with the lessee's consent acts in a manner that unreasonably disturbs other tenants' peaceful enjoyment of the premises. You want to make sure that your leases have a provision in, in them which allow for this um, because you, you want to make sure that you have the ability to utilize this statutory provision in the event that this becomes an issue. Most common examples that we see are loud parties, uh, loud music. Uh, sometimes we have incidences where there's fighting on the premises, uh, which is disturbing the peace, um, erratic behavior. Um, you know, if you have someone showing up in the middle of the night, knocking and banging on doors or trying to get into somebody else's unit because they're um, intoxicated, uh, we've had that before. Uh, so uh, any one of those would um, qualify under this uh, provision of disturbing the peace. Then you've got kind of the catch-all in some respects. Uh, the other kind of the, the major um, top three, I would say, is the material breach of the lease. And this is where a lessee violates material term of the written lease agreement between the lessor and the lessee. You want to make sure that your lease is again, like the other one I just mentioned, has a catch-all provision in it, which does allow for you to, um, to have this. Uh, granted, if your lease has these provisions that say the tenant is required to do certain things or maintain snow removal or pay utilities, if they are not doing those things, that is a material breach of the lease and you can get an action for eviction on that um, failure of the tenant to do so. Some of these major provisions include uh, smoking, uh, pets, the property is not being maintained, uh, the upkeep of the property and any illegal activity on the property. Uh, I'll give you an example. I had a, uh, an eviction uh, in the northern part of the state and the reason why we were evicting uh, was uh, this elderly uh, young elderly lady uh, was in a unit that was a non-smoking unit, and um, this uh, elderly lady was smoking like a chimney, and uh, was causing disruption and disturbances for the surrounding uh, tenants, and wouldn't stop smoking. And so eventually, we had to proceed with getting her evicted because. Um, she wasn't. She wouldn't stop smoking in the unit. Uh, we've also had situations. We're currently dealing with a situation where we've got tenants who are not um, up keeping the property up, and they're they're getting uh, a notices from the city that says that your property is not being maintained in a proper fashion, and that would also be a breach of the lease because the lease says that they're required to keep the property in a good, cleanly uh, condition. So uh, could be a lot of different things. Like I said, you just wanna make sure that you have your material terms of your lease well written within your lease agreement so that in the event any one of these issues come up, you can rely on that um, and determine if that's material breach in the event you would need an eviction. So those are the main reasons why you would proceed with an eviction. Now let's talk about the process that you need to follow in the event you find yourself in need of an eviction. So first you have to determine, and the step one is the notice to quit to the tenant, or uh, we call it, you know, we call it a notice of termination or a notice of intent to evict. I mean, like I said, there are a lot of different things that you can call it, uh, but the intent of the document is the same. It is to put the tenant on notice that there's a violation and you're seeking to have them evicted for such violation. So the first thing we need to do is we need to determine what the violation is. Do we have a failure to pay rent? 
Do we have a violation of the lease? Do we have a disrupt disruption of the peace? So once we know that, then we would have to prepare the notice of uh, intent to evict. And what the purpose of that document is, is to inform the tenant there's a violation, to inform the tenant the landlord is proceeding with the eviction, and to inform the tenant that the lease is not being renewed. Once you have that document prepared, then you can proceed uh, and statutorily you have to serve that notice on the tenant. And the statute is very, very specific about the service requirements. And you have to have and, and recommend that you have a third party notice uh, served by a third party individual. And the statute's very specific uh, that it says, you know, it's a non-interested party. Uh, so what we recommend is we don't recommend landlords serving their own notices to quit. Uh, because you don't want a situation where you've got your word against the tenant's word about whether or not this notice was actually served. So we, we definitely recommend uh, for purposes of uh, avoiding any appearance of impropriety or having anything called into question, you have a third party individual or entity do it. And those can be sheriff's offices or they can be private process servers. Uh, whatever is available in your particular area, uh, certainly recommend it. Um, you know, the it is going to cost a little bit to have it done that way, probably anywhere from 80 bucks to, you know, maybe 125, depending on where you're at. But in the long run, it's better to pay that cost up front, in my opinion, rather than getting to court and then you have it questioned and then all of a sudden may have to start the process over. And now you've just wasted more attorney's fees and time because now you got to start it over had you just done it the right way the first way, you wouldn't have had to redo it. So there's some cost in it up front, but in the back end, uh, it makes more sense to just have it done uh, that way and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, once you have that notice prepared, once it gets served on that third party, the tenant within that notice is instructed to vacate the property and they're given three days uh, before the landlord can proceed with eviction. Then once in the event uh, that they don't proceed to vacate, then you have to proceed with the second step of the process. And that's the legal uh, process that involves actually going to court. And that's where we discuss what we call the summons complaint. So the second step, as I mentioned, is the summons complaint. And that is where we get the court involved because the tenant has not voluntarily vacated after receiving the three-day notice to quit. This is the official court action for removal of the tenant. And what the summons will do, it informs the tenant of the time and the place of the hearing. And the time specified in the summons may not be fewer than three days, but, nor, but not more than 15 days before the date the summons is issued. And this is very specific because the statute requires this. And so you have to make sure that when you're serving your summons, that you serve the summons within that statutory time frame. Uh, if you don't, or you can't complete service within that time frame, then you have to start over. Uh, the complaint outlines the reason for eviction, so it will say, you know, landlord uh, is the landlord of this premises, tenant is renting this unit, and here are the reasons why we are proceeding with eviction. Both the summons and complaint must be personally served on the tenant. And if the tenant cannot be found, the statute allows the documents to be posted on the premises after it has been attempted at least once between the hours of 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. And the statute is very specific on this. And so when you are making sure that your um, sheriff's departments or your process servers are serving these documents, they are doing it within the confines of the statutory requirements. Um, I had a situation once where I was a, a northern community on the western side of the state. Uh, the, that particular department, uh, sheriff's department, didn't understand that they could post the summons. So I drove all the way up for the hearing, got there, and realized they didn't complete the service timely because they didn't know that they could serve, post the summons which uh, most of the sheriff's offices uh, uh, are aware of that. Most process servers are aware of that. They've done enough of these that they know, uh, but you wanna make sure that uh, if you're dealing with someone who's not familiar with these types of service requirements that you inform them 
that you know these are the parameters of which this service must be done. And again, we definitely recommend that you have it done by an independent third party that is a the sheriff's office or it's a private process server. You want to be able to file an affidavit of service with the court that says this person is attesting that they went through the process and had these papers served appropriately pursuant to statute. And there must be an affidavit of service or affidavit of posting filed by the sheriff's department or, or signed by the sheriff's department or signed by your process server that when you get to the process of eviction that you can have that filed with the court so the court can look at that and say yes, these documents were uh, appropriately served. And so you'd have an affidavit of service for your notice of intent to evict or your notice to quit. And then you have an affidavit of service for the summons and complaint um, that eventually gets served. And uh, whether you're working with an attorney or not, uh, you want to make sure that these service documents are filed prior to the court proceeding, uh, because the judges definitely want to going to want to know that the statutory requirements for services have been met. And that again applies to the notice to quit, and it also applies to the summons and complaint. All right, so the next step then, in the event that the tenant does not proceed uh, with vacating, uh, typically once we get to the summons complaint process, we, we do proceed with the hearing. And at the hearing, if the tenant does not show up, the landlord nine times out of 10 uh, obtains a default judgment. And a default judgment is essentially the court saying, because the other party didn't show up, I'm going to give you what you're asking for. Uh, we've had quite a few default judgments uh, since I've been practicing. Um, eventually, even if you get to the get to the hearing, you still might end up with a judgment. But if the tenant doesn't show up, the quickest, easiest, simplest way to get a judgment is the default judgment. If a tenant does show up, then the landlord must present evidence supporting the eviction. And typically, this comes in the form of testimony from a landlord or a property manager. Uh, you often have a copy of your lease available and submitted into evidence. Uh, sometimes you have a ledger of the past due balances or you have your landlord or your property manager attesting or testifying to the past due balances. And sometimes in situations where it's uh, property disturbances or unkept property uh, or it's a destruction of a unit, then you would also have photographs that would be submitted uh, to the court as evidence of those types of violations. Once the landlord has uh, submitted evidence because the landlord is the moving party, then the tenant has the opportunity to uh, testify. And the statute in North Dakota is very, very uh, specific and it limits what the tenant can eventually can essentially raise as counterclaims. And the tenant is actually statutorily prohibited from raising any counterclaims except a set off to a demand made for damages or for rents or profits. So it essentially in a nutshell, what that means is the, the court of evictions in North Dakota are very specific and they're very limited. All the court wants to know is whether there's a breach of the lease and whether this tenant has the right or to stay in that premise or whether the landlord has the right to evict them. We're not going to go down a rabbit hole of all of these other items or issues that the tenant wants to bring up unless we're talking about um, whether or not the tenant would be entitled to any sort of set off for, for rents or something of that nature. And then eventually, depending on um, how the, the evidence is presented, the judge will, of course, make a ruling. And uh, at that point, uh, we would have a situation where the court would say, we're going to proceed and grant the eviction. And then once that happens, uh, the court, uh, if the court finds for the landlord, the court shall enter a judgment for immediate restitution of the premises or the property. If the tenant demonstrates that immediate restitution would be a substantial hardship, the court may grant tenant up to five days to vacate the property. There is an exception. Uh, if an eviction is for disturbing the peace, immediate possession is often granted. Normally, at least with my experience, I would say that a lot of my uh, tenants or excuse me, a lot of my landlords would would most of the time generally allow for the five days, depending on the circumstances. Uh, sometimes it's immediate. Um, you know, if we've got a situation where we've got a family with small children, uh, then you know the the landlords are usually uh, make the decision. Uh, I'm okay with the five days to allow the family to to vacate. But if we've got a situation where someone doesn't show up at the hearing, 
uh, then we typically ask for immediate possession and allow the um, landlord to proceed right away. And of course, at the hearing, if there is a landlord has uh, conversations with a tenant and, and maybe they're maybe they're on good terms and maybe this was just a situation where the tenant um, uh, I had one situation one time where the, the tenant was a single father and uh, he was struggling um, a lot of family dynamics uh, he had a young child a young girl probably maybe five or so and um, did the best that he could to try to get his rent up but finally just kind of really fell behind and the landlord had agreed to give him above and beyond the five additional days to, to vacate the unit so there is a lot of discretion there uh, with the landlord and the tenant but if the landlord and the tenant cannot agree the max the court can allow is five days and that is set by statute and eventually the court will issue an eviction for uh, the uh, tenant um, I have uh, never had a hearing where um, the tenant was allowed to remain in the premises. Uh, not to say that that couldn't happen, but uh, it has never happened uh, in my practice. Step four is once you get the eviction and you get a, uh, the judgment for eviction, doesn't automatically mean that your tenant is going to be very nice and vacate. There are certain circumstances where the tenant will show up to the hearing and say, you know, you can have to forcibly drag me out or they don't show up to the hearing and they still don't vacate. If that happens, then the next process that you must do is you must file a writ of execution or a writ of eviction with the clerk of court. And essentially what that does, it is uh, a court that the writ is the legal authority that gives the sheriff the right to go on the property and forcibly remove the tenant. Um, this is, like I said, this issue or this writ is issued by the county clerk of court's office after the judgment has been issued with the clerk, or excuse me, with the court. And then that writ is executed by the county sheriff's department. And this is again in a situation where you've got your writ, uh, you've got your judgment for eviction, but the tenant is just not willingly allow or not. Um, going to be vacating the premises. Uh, and then you have to take the necessary step to forcibly remove them from, uh, the, pro from the property. Now, having said that, uh, there are some special considerations that we deal with with evictions. And, and this is really important for landlords because this is where you can get into trouble. Uh, we definitely recommend that you do not employ any sort of self-help methods or remedies. And what that means is if some tenant is not paying your rent, do not go change their locks. Do not start removing personal items. Uh, those are very, um, very important things um, you, you just cannot do. You need to proceed with the um, eviction process and follow the statutory process because if you don't, uh, you could be liable for treble damages, which is three times the amount of damages in the event that you implore, uh, employ any of these um, methods or remedies. So uh, it is frustrating for tenant, excuse me, frustrating for landlords sometimes uh, to have to go through this process when you know that the tenant is thumbing their nose at you or the system but you have to do it. And so uh, you wanna make sure that you're doing it right on the back end or the front end so it doesn't come around and, and bite you on the back end. And another thing, uh, when it comes to uh, communications with your uh, tenants, document, 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 whether it's text, emails, notices of any sort, uh, you want to make sure that you've got that in written communication. Uh, it's very important because if it's not, it's going to come down to your word against the tenant's word. And so it's really important to make sure that you have all of your communications documented, especially if we get into a situation where we've got the court involved and we've got communications or we've got different claims about when rent was paid, or maybe you were told or claim the tenant claims that you were allowing them to pay rent late and there's nothing that supports otherwise. Uh, it just becomes a little bit of a mess that you can always avoid by making sure that you have that proper documentation in place so that um, you can um, um, stand behind those statements that you make in front of the judge in court. Uh, one of the other major considerations that we often take into uh, to, um, context when we're dealing with evictions is service animals. And you know, service animals by federal law are not considered pets. 
the um, Housing Administration does not require a service animal to be trained or certified as a service animal. And you must evaluate a request for a reasonable accommodation. Uh, you have to assess whether a person has a, bis a disability and uh, is, there a disability, is there a disability related to the need for the service animal. Uh, you can factor in the direct threat of harm to others. You know, obviously, um, you know, if we've got a situation where you have a service animal that's, a, a, you know, a boa constrictor, I don't, you know, you have to think about those or you have a service animal that, you know, that's a pit bull that's been known to attack others. I mean, those are certain things that you can take into consideration. And you're not allowed to assess a pet deposit for a service animal. And in the event that you are unsure about whether a tenant does in fact have a disability, you can ask for documentation if a disability is not readily apparent. Uh, we, we um, before I would say that we very rarely had any incidences with uh, service animals, but I think as we're becoming more cognizant uh, as a society with mental health issues, uh, service animals are becoming more prevalent. And so you might uh, see more of these issues as um, landlords. So just something to be, uh, you know, keeping um, in uh, keeping in the back of your mind is, is something that may become a consideration in the future. But again, just kind of the basics. So in the event that these questions get raised, you can certainly uh, answer them the best you can. Uh, we're kind of getting out of the COVID-19 protocols. Uh, so that was a big thing last year and the year before about whether we could proceed with evictions or not. But uh, that has been lifted by the North Dakota courts and um, the federal courts for some time now. So uh, there are no additional restrictions on landlords uh, with regard to um, uh, COVID-19 and not being able to evict a tenant uh, because they're past due on rent. Uh, I do know that there are some um, uh, uh, programs. I think RentBridge is one of them that I've, I've seen uh, that are assisting um, individuals of still affected by that um, with assistance in rent and things of that nature. But uh, bottom line is, is that there is no uh, statutory or legal law in place that prevents a landlord from now proceeding with an eviction. Uh, we've, we've handled quite a few of these. I did quite a few evictions in actually in 2020, the latter part of 2020, as well as into 2021. So um, I think there's been a little bit of a misconception about that with some landlords, but that um, that restriction no longer exists. So, all righty. Well, that is uh, the end of my presentation. So again, it was kind of evictions in a short uh, and sweet nutshell. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Uh, somebody had asked what what rent bridge is, uh, and I think someone else just responded. But rent bridge is a the program that is set up through the North Dakota um, Housing, I believe. Um, but it is a program that allows uh, tenants to apply to get rental assistance to um, help with their rent in the event that they qualify under certain circumstances. So um, we have seen it a little bit here in uh, the southwest area. Um, especially during COVID-19, uh, but it does require, um, you know, you, the tenant to submit paperwork and things of that nature. It's not automatically guaranteed. Uh, we, we encourage um, tenants to do that. Obviously, we want their rents to be paid, uh, but it is, it is a program that we have uh, seen utilized, at least here in the Southwest District. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. Um,
And I think um, uh, Ms. Lentz here had commented on uh, Rent Bridge may now be known as North Dakota Rent Help. Uh, that is very possible. Um, uh, she's asking whether a, a person can be evicted without a court appearance. Uh, yes, uh, but you have to make sure that you are giving the proper notices of the notice of intent to evict and the summons complaint. If both of those notices are properly served and then the tenant does not show up for court, absolutely you can get a, a judgment for eviction. It's just that default judgment I was talking about. All right. Um, if renters give permission to have friends, quote unquote, stay, to stay in their unit, but actually renter vacates, can you make the friends leave? Uh, technically, uh, I would say yes. Um, one, you'd want to check and determine whether or not your lease allows for any sort of subleasing, uh, whether there's a uh, written agreement between the tenant and the new tenant. Uh, but if that person does not have the legal authority to be on the property and that prior tenant who did vacated, then you could be in a situation where those new individuals or the friends are squatting on the property, uh, and then you might be finding yourself in a situation where you would may want to proceed with an eviction, or practically, if those tenants are uh, in the unit, they're taking care of it, and they're willing to pay rent, there might not be anything wrong practically with signing a lease agreement with those tenants, uh, because then you're, you're just getting um, rent, and the, uh, the unit is being occupied. So you might want to I definitely recommend you take that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if you've got a situation where uh, you know, you've got illicit drug use and, and the individual who is under the lease ends up in jail. And then you've got, you know, questionable characters coming in the property um, and staying there and squatting. That would definitely be a reason why you would want them evicted from the premises. And you can certainly do that. Um, and that has happened um, before. What happens or what should a landlord do if an eviction process is started, but the tenant leaves and doesn't show up for the hearing and doesn't show at his residence? This happens a lot. Uh, what we would typically do and what I would recommend is if, if for some reason you serve the paperwork and you, the summons gets served and the tenant then maybe two or days later or something vacates the unit, we would still recommend that the landlord proceed with the eviction uh, and go through the hearing because you want to make sure that you secure the judgment for the rents, the past due rents. Uh, so you want to make sure if you have a monetary judgment. And then the other thing, too, is what happens if the you know you serve the summons and then all of a sudden you think the tenant leaves, but then the tenant shows back up a day later. Well, now we've got to start the process over because you dismiss the, the judicial process. So we typically recommend that you, once you start it, you finish it so that you can get that judgment for eviction in case the tenant shows back up and you get the order from the court for the monetary judgment in the event past due rents or due and owing. If there are noise complaints from neighbors, is there to be prior warning notices first before eviction does take place? I would typically recommend, uh, depends on how the notices is given. I mean, if you have the, the sheriff's office showing up every day or the city's police department because there are noise complaints, the tenant cannot say they weren't aware. Uh, but what we typically recommend in that situation as the landlord, put the tenant on notice that We've received these complaints, document them to the tenant, let them know that they need to rectify their uh, uh, behavior. And if they're not, then eventually there might be some sort of eviction process because they're disturbing the peace of others on the premises. But definitely, it is much better for you as the landlord to always make sure that you are giving proper notice of any issue to the tenant making the tenant fully aware, whether they heed your warning or not is on them, but you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to put them on notice. So when you get to a hearing situation, you can attest, your honor, I told them on this day, this day, this day, and this day, and this is what I told them versus I never told them that I would likely evict them in the event of this noise complaint. So it's a way for you to inform the tenant of the consequences and document that you did in the form of a letter or email or text or something, or it's a notice that's posted, uh, but letting them know 
um, because that's going to be a much better position or argument to present to a court in the event you find yourself in that situation. Okay. Um, best way to regain credit if someone is evicted. I notice it's pretty hard finding rentals for people who have gone through an eviction. This, of course, is depending on what they were evicted for. Um, that one is kind of a little outside my scope. I, I don't deal with any sort of the credit requirements or the credit, um, you know, uh, processes with that. I would assume that there would be difficulty uh, if you have a situation where you've got an eviction on your on your record that's showing up. I would assume, you know, it's going to be up to the landlord to determine how much deference they're going to give to that and how much uh, they're willing to take a risk on a tenant that has that on their um, history. Um, so that that's a little bit more of a landlord discretionary uh, uh, process than it is a legal one. When you have a smoke free policy for your apartment building and there is a tenant smoking, what are the steps to take to enforce the policy? Well, in that situation, what you would want to do and what I would recommend is to give the tenant notice that you have reason to believe that they're violating the terms and conditions of the, the rental unit, especially if you, know, if you have a no smoking policy. Um, that would be a material breach of the lease, in my opinion, if it's in there and you have a, the lease provides for it. Uh, you would give them notice, let them have an opportunity to correct their behavior. Uh, if they, they don't and they continue to engage in that type of behavior, then you would serve that notice to quit. And in that notice to quit, that's where you would identify the material breach, which would be the fact that the tenant continues to smoke in the unit. If they don't vacate, then you proceed with the summons and complaint and move forward with that. Is there a local agency that assists tenants with eviction defense cases? Not that I'm aware of. There isn't in uh, there isn't in the Southwest District. Now, sometimes tenants try to get uh, assistance through um, like legal aid or legal services of North Dakota. Um, but I would say ninety percent. I would say ninety five percent of the tenants that I have dealt with um, representing landlords are not represented and show up um, pro se to these hearings. I very rarely, and, and realistically, I mean, the fact of the matter is, I mean, if, if they're struggling to pay rent, they're likely not able to hire an attorney to assist them with defending an eviction. And most of the time, when we show up to these hearings, the court says, are you in default? I would say nine times out of 10, the tenants are very forthcoming and saying, yes, I am. And at that point, if that is the case, then we're just deciding how much time the court is going to allow them to remain in the property to, to get their belongings and to vacate. Um, this next question is piggybacking off of the friends question. Um, what about if they establish residency? Um, you know, establishing residency is more of a statutory requirement as far as um, you can be a resident of North Dakota uh, after a certain time frame, but that still doesn't give you the legal right to remain in a premises of which you don't have a lease to. Uh, so, you know, I may be a resident of North Dakota, but I can't go, you know, into the housing unit across the street and, and uh, take a unit and just say, I'm going to use it. I still have to have the legal right to be there. And that comes in the form of a lease agreement. Uh, so if they don't have that, and if there's no authority that's been given to them, uh, then at that point, I think you would have the right to proceed with an eviction, depending on the circumstances. Um, do evictions stay on your record forever, or do they come off record within a time frame? Well, eviction is not a, a criminal uh, case, obviously. It's a civil one. Uh, so um, you know, depending on state requirements, uh, I would assume that, um, you know, those I've seen those stay on there, um, you know, 20, 20 some years. So it really just kind of depends, but it's not like a criminal case where you can likely have it expunged or uh, it, you know, uh, gets dismissed after a certain while. So it could, it could have some long term effects on your financial status as a tenant in the event that you do get one of them, if you do get a judgment against you, because it is a, it's essentially a monetary judgment 
uh, for the amounts potentially that are due and owing. And, you know, that could be a judgment for several, several thousands of dollars, depending on how much the tenant is behind in rent. Okay. If a person is on a month to month lease, the tenant has not been late in pain, can they be evicted for no reason? I'm sorry if you covered this, someone came into my office. I don't have my dogs at work to keep people from opening my door, LOL. <laughs> okay, so the question is, if you're on a month to month and can you just be evicted for no reason? Yep, the tenant okay. has not, and the tenant hasn't been late in pain. The answer to that is no. So what you would have to do is, is if you're on a month to month, you are allowed to terminate the lease, but you have to give a month's notice prior to termination or prior to changing the lease terms. So if the tenant is um, doing everything they're supposed to, they're paying rent, they're on a month to month, you can't just go to them and say, oh, I'm gonna kick you out in three days. Nope, you have to give them notice to say, you're on a month to month tenancy. I'm gonna give you 30 days notice that I'm either terminating the lease or I'm changing the terms of the lease. And you have to give them notice to do that. So, and that that's a protection for tenants in that regard, because if you are doing everything that you're supposed to, you're, uh, you know, you're paying your rent, you're a model tenant, you know, we don't, we don't want landlords to be able to, you know, willy nilly just, you know, kick people out. They have to have time certainly to, to make arrangements, especially if they're not in default. Now, if you're in default, that's your own fault. And, you know, you've got three days to get out. Um, but if your tenant is again, doing what they're supposed to be doing, you have to follow the statutory requirements and, and give them proper notice. And that's based on the term of the lease that currently exists at the time that you want to terminate. Um, here's kind of a scenario. I know of a situation where a motel in Jamestown rents rooms on a monthly basis. Tenant has a lease. He fell behind on rent, received notice for hearing. Hearing date was changed to a later date by court. Before court date, he was locked out of the room and all his property thrown in a dumpster. Much was removed prior to tenant trying to recover belongings. What are the steps tenant should take now? Well, um, you know, I think that's kind of be really dependent on the facts and circumstances. Um, because, you know, depending on the type of lease, you know, motels are and hotels are quite a bit different than leasing. Um, so I think you have to whether the action that could be taken is going to be very heavily dependent upon what that agreement actually says the tenant's rights are, uh, because that is, um, again, those those are different things, whether you're talking an apartment unit or you're talking in a day by day uh, hotel or motel, uh, those are two very different legal concepts. Uh, so without a little bit more information, it would be really hard to say, but you know, that tenant I would assume was given notice of a hearing. If the court changes that notice of a hearing, the court is well within its right to do that. Uh, that tenant shows up or doesn't show up, you know, that's going to be a little bit on the tenant too. I mean, you, you can't not show up for a hearing and expect your voice to be heard, you have to show up and assert your rights. So if that tenant isn't doing that, you're not helping your case by not showing up. Um, but I think the answer to that question, like I said, is, is gonna be really heavily dependent upon what that written agreement is with that uh, tenant and landlord about what rights and responsibilities of each of those parties exist. If a tenant has bed bugs and they've done what they can to get rid of them, is it up to them or the landlord to step in with assistance? Can a tenant break their lease if the landlord isn't going, isn't doing anything to help? That's a unique uh, situation. Uh, one that I can't say that I've ever had come up, um, but I would say that, you know, at a basic minimum, a landlord is required to make sure that uh, the, the premises that they are renting is habitable. And if that is, if the bed bugs are something associated with the conduct of the tenant, then I don't think that the landlord has a responsibility to um, assist with that. But if the landlord is operating, you know, um, a questionable unit that may not be in the best shape, 
uh, and there are concerns about the sanitary conditions of that unit, then yeah, that might be something the landlord may have to do. Um, you know, we've had situations where we actually had, now that I think about it, um, uh, I think it was an infestation of some, some sort. I don't know if it was bed bugs, but it may have been some other pest. Uh, and the landlord uh, wanted to get in and clean it. And the tenant was not um, cooperating at all. And, and so we finally had to go to the process of going to court and getting them evicted because you know the landlord is saying, well, I can't get in there and keep my property up. This is disrupting my property. It's disrupting other disrupting other uh, neighbors. We've got an infestation. I need to be able to get in there and secure my property. And if this tenant isn't going to cooperate, then it doesn't do us any good to have a tenant in the unit. And so that can be, um, like I said, we, we were able to get one of those evictions uh, through, uh, but um, a lot of that is just cooperation between the tenant and the landlord. Um, you don't want to be a landlord that's known for having bed bugs in your establishment, and you also don't want to be a tenant that's known for allowing it. Uh, so the best situation there is a lot of cooperation and communication between the tenant and the landlord. I have a person who is on housing and it's paid in full each month. She does not break the rules, but has complained about black mold and noise from neighbors. They gave her an eviction notice and I told her she does not have to leave until she has an appearance in court. Did I tell her the wrong information? She had a lease and is now month to month. Well, if, if, she is, if she's received a notice of intent to evict and she hasn't vacated yet, then at that point, um, unless uh, I suppose she could remain in the unit, but once you get that judgment for eviction or you get that sheriff showing up knocking on your door and saying it's time for you to go, then you have to go um, because then now you could potentially find yourself in contempt of court because you're with lawfully or knowingly violating a court order and that's the writ of eviction. So um, is it possible that you know tenants try to stay in the units as long as they can to avoid um, getting evicted. It happens all the time, but at some point the tenant has to get out. And that's typically after we've again got the judgment or got the judgment, got the summons and complaint uh, judgment, and then we've got the writ of eviction and the sheriff shows up. Okay. Um... You mentioned service dogs. My understanding is that service dogs must always be certified, but housing authority accepts emotional support animals as well that don't need any certification. Is this correct? That's my understanding. Um, I think that the way that the federal rules are set up is that they want to give tenants as much deference in this regard because we're talking about someone's health and, and well well-being. Uh, and like I said, we have my general perception that we have a society have, have come a long way with regard to mental health. And so I, I think we take it a little bit more seriously. And so I, I think that a lot of deference is going to be given to uh, these types of requests. Um, but, you know, emotional support animals, um, we see it all the time. Uh, and really, you know, you as landlords have to determine what sort of uh, policies you're going to implement and adopt based on the federal rules regarding it and be consistent with it um, and, and make sure that everyone is being treated the same and being treated fairly pursuant to the terms of the law. Um, but again, you know, there are, it's not a free for all uh, by any means. You still have some discretionary decision making. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if the tenant or, uh, is cooperating and the, the animal isn't causing a nuisance, is not disturbing anyone else, is not causing noise, not a danger to anyone, um, and is not causing any damage in the unit, then, then maybe as landlords, it's not that big of a concern. And just so everybody knows, our next week, next week's presentation is on service animals and emotional support animals. So any of those questions that you may have, please tune in next week for our training on that topic. Um, next question, in an apartment complex, is there a law that states they have to clean the sidewalks when it, sidewalks when it snows? I have a disabled client who can't get out when it snows because she cannot go down the snow-covered sidewalk. 
Um, there's no statutory law on it, uh, but you know, I, I would think that in an apartment complex, the landlord uh, would you know, be responsible in a lot of respects for those common areas. It's not like a, um, you know, a house that you rent where you are required to be, um, uh, you know, shoveling your own driveway or your own sidewalk. Uh, you know, there also might be a situation depending on the layout of the unit. Uh, you know, if it's a one that goes directly from the, you know, the street to the, 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 the apartment door, you know, that might be more of a requirement. Um, but, um, you know, kind of depends. It also is going to depend on whether your lease agreement provides that the tenant is responsible for that. Um, so um, most of the time, I would say that a lot of the uh, landlords that I've at least dealt with um, take care of that. Um, but again, it's going to depend on the layout of the building. It's going to depend on what your lease agreement provides for. Um, so all of those factors are going to take in, be taken into consideration. Okay, um, a follow up for the motel question. Um, the tenant was locked out before the second hearing date. He hasn't had a chance to not show up. How does he recover damages? That is a situation where the best thing that you would want to say to that tenant is seek legal counsel, uh, because at that point, it's really hard to determine what damages might be appropriate or uh, what um, remedies you may have. Everybody's situation is different, uh, but that's why you would want to call an attorney and have the attorney visit with you about what potential options may be available. Okay. Um, I know a tenant paying rent but not able to stay at his apartment because it is not handicap accessible and the landlord refuses to make it that way. Can he break his lease? Um, I would, uh, I guess I would want to know what the lease agreement provides for as far as the term and the requirements. Uh, those are going to be big ones. Uh, the other thing too, I mean, I would assume that when the tenant leased the property, the tenant was likely disabled at the time he entered into the lease and knew what the conditions of the property were. Uh, so if that's the case, it's going to be really hard to say after the fact that, now it's a problem when it was likely known to the tenant at the time he entered into the lease agreement. Uh, so all of those factors would come into play. Uh, but, um, you know, that's a situation too, where you look at the circumstances and you've got a situation as a landlord where you may have an elderly gentleman who is a double amputee and he's in a wheelchair. And the only way to get to and from his apartment is um, stairs and you don't have an elevator. Uh, do you want to be the landlord that is known for going after a tenant because they got a six month lease and, and the, the gentleman is physically disabled? Um, you know, so there's a lot of practical business sense that comes into that, uh, that, you know, is going to determine how you want to handle your properties. Uh, because if that's the case, I mean, I would likely say it's not worth it, you know, at that point to, to proceed with trying to enforce that lease, um, you know, do the, the, the better thing and, and maybe allow that tenant out because that, that's not going to be something that that tenant is going to be able to handle. Okay, so a follow up to the mold, the tenant with the mold. Um, the, evic the tenant only received an intent to evict, not anything from a sheriff or legal entity. It was taped to her door. Doesn't she have the right to be heard in court as to why they are evicting? They did not give her a reason. Well, typically the notice of intent to evict comes first. And then in the event the tenant does not vacate, then that's when they need to proceed with the summons complaint. So if that tenant hasn't received that document, then they should still be in the unit at that point. Um, because if the tenant receives the document and vacates, that's on the tenant. The tenant receives the document and decides not to vacate because they want to contest it. Then that puts the onus back on the landlord to proceed with the next part of the eviction. And that is the summons and complaint. And that's where you get to court. That's where the tenant has the right to make their arguments. All right. Well, I think that is it for questions. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you again, Christina, for presenting and taking time out of your schedule to do this today. We really appreciate it. Um, great information. Um, those of you that are still on, and if you would, if you need a certificate, please type your first and last name, as well as your email in the chat box, and I will be sure to get that to Marilyn, and we'll get those sent out um, after the or as soon as possible. Um, so again, we'll leave the chat up for just a little bit to get your information in there. Thanks again, Christina, for presenting. Yep, you're welcome, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. I'll give it one more minute before I end the meeting. Okay, I'm so far got everybody copied, I believe. <laughs> All right, I think let me double check one more line. <clears throat> 